In this video, we will present you with interesting facts you probably didn't know about many companies. There are curiosities about Burger King, Tesla, Amazon, old Japanese businesses, and also details about companies trying to profit from space. Let's start with 5 facts about Burger King. The American fast food chain Burger King has gone through ups and downs since its creation in 1954. The famous home of the Whopper has a fascinating journey with unexpected twists and facts. The chain says it serves 11 million guests every day in more than 18,000 restaurants around the world. But what were the secrets of this trajectory? So here we go. Number 5. A Vegan Sued Burger King with the alternative meat market poised to grow substantially in the next few years, it was no surprise when Burger King rolled out a non-meat version of its Whopper in the United States and some other countries. What no one expected is that a vegan would later sue the fast food chain because of this. The Impossible Whopper, a beef-like plant-based burger made in partnership with Impossible Meat, a California company, came to American restaurants in August 2019. A couple of months later, a man sued the company alleging that the burger he believed to be vegan actually was not because the vegan patty was cooked on the same grill as the other burgers. The company stated on its website that the burgers are all cooked together and that it offers a microwave cooking alternative upon request. In July 2020, a federal judge dismissed the lawsuit, saying that Burger King never promised a vegan burger. Although there's been quite an uproar about the new vegetarian burger, the company saw plant-based burger sales decline between the third and fourth quarters in 2019. Despite the controversy and slow sales at the end of 2019, Burger King's CEO already stated that plant-based products will continue to be sold throughout the chain. He also said that the restaurant will possibly add other meat substitute products to the menu in the future. Burger King is not the only one targeting this market. Fast food chains like McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts are also experimenting with such products. Number 4. The owners are not Americans. The love of hamburgers has made the meat patty an all-American symbol. It's almost a synonym for American food. Not everyone knows that one of the most famous brand burgers, the Whopper, is owned by an investment company that at its core is not US American, but Brazilian. In 2010, 3G Capital Investment acquired Burger King in a deal that was worth $4 billion. 3G Capital still is the largest stakeholder. The investment group has also bought other American icons like Budweiser, Heinz Ketchup, and Kraft Foods. 3G was founded and is controlled by a group of former Brazilian bank owners. They have a reputation for streamlining inefficient companies and delivering good results. That means they have a reputation for aggressively cutting costs and jobs. That's exactly what they did with Burger King. After 10 years of Brazilian domination, the private plane is a thing of the past. Costs were cut, and an entirely different business strategy was implemented. Number 3. It had a 32-year-old CEO. In 2013, Daniel Swartz, a former Credit Suisse analyst and 3G Capital alumni, was appointed Burger King's new CEO. Seen from a professional background perspective, a fairly logical choice from the financial market to a multinational company. But there was something odd about it. He was 32 years old. Yes, you heard correctly, 32. Outside Silicon Valley, very few companies the size of Burger King have such young CEOs. The average age of a sitting S&P 500 CEO is 58 years old. Daniel Schwartz wasn't even the youngest one on the team. Burger King's CFO was 28 years old and the head of investment relations was 29 years old. All of this caught Wall Street and analysts by surprise, and everyone wondered what would happen to the company. In 2014, the magazine Bloomberg Businessweek published a cover story with the headline, Burger King is run by children. The approach of the new CEO was radical. He was quoted saying that he put the business and the firm ahead of himself and he was very open about his hands-on approach. He cleaned store bathrooms and learned how to cook a Whopper to get a feel for the whole business. The young CEO was also in charge of acquiring new companies like Canadian coffee chain Tim Hortons in 2014 and Popeyes in 2017. After both acquisitions, he became the CEO of the new company that groups all brands, the Restaurant Brands International. In 2019, he moved up to RBI executive chairman position, and Jose Sill, a longtime Burger King executive, became the CEO.
Sill was 49 years old when appointed CEO. Number 2. Burger King owns only 52 stores. Out of 8,838 stores, Burger King owns only 52 of them. The company works pretty exclusively with the franchising system, but it wasn't always like this. One of the most controversial moves of the new owners and the young CEO was the radical change to the system. In 2010, when 3G Capital acquired the fast food chain, it owned 1,344 stores and had 10,907 in the franchising system. By 2013, the restaurant company had only 52 stores and 13,615 franchised. This had an impact on the revenues and helped save costs. Revenues dropped from $2.34 billion in 2011 to $1.15 billion in 2013. Since this restructuring, the revenues rebounded and increased again between 2015 and 2019 when they went from $1.1 billion to $1.78 billion. Selling all restaurants was a big turning point in the history of the company. Since then, Burger King's main focus has been on brand development, international expansion, and marketing, while the restaurant's daily business is solely the responsibility of the franchise owners. Number 1. There is a massive gap between Burger King and McDonald's. We always think of the two chains as competitors, but there is actually a huge difference in size. Both companies sell the same core product and started franchising businesses in the 50s, but the similarities end there. In revenues, McDonald's is more than 10 times bigger. While in 2019, McDonald's revenues reached 21 billion, Burger King closed the year with 1.78 billion. The McDonald's system-wide sales, which accounts for all sales, including franchise restaurants, was $100 billion in 2019, while Burger King's were $22 billion. While McDonald's had around 36,000 restaurants in 2019, Burger King had 18,838. Another difference is in the brand value. According to a study by WPP and Cantor, the difference between the two brands is huge. While McDonald's is worth $130 billion, sitting comfortably on the top of the world's most valued food brands list, Burger King is in seventh place, with a $7 billion value. There's also a big difference in the domestic market. McDonald's, the biggest burger chain, had 13,837 stores in the United States in 2019. Burger King, the second, had 7,346. Wendy's, Sonic Drive-In, and Jack in the Box followed. That means Burger King is closer to third place than to first. In this competition, McDonald's rules. And now let's take a look at five facts about Tesla. From the outside, it seems like Elon Musk's eccentricities are what make Tesla so omnipresent in the media. The longtime CEO is connected in celebrity circles, regularly posts controversial opinions on his Twitter account, and clearly loves being in the limelight. At the moment, no other CEO is so much in the public eye like Musk. But behind the unconventional style is a company that has risen to the top very quickly. From the startup days in 2003, to 2020, Tesla went from nearly bankrupt to the most valuable car maker in the world, worth more than $350 billion. That's much more than traditional automakers like Toyota, Volkswagen, and General Motors. All of this with less than 2% of the auto market share and much smaller revenues. The company has disrupted a multi-billion dollar market with its electric models and seems to be on the fast track to conquer the world. After opening a factory in Shanghai in 2019, a new one is expected to open in Germany in 2021. The country, home of Volkswagen, Mercedes, and BMW, is bracing itself for what will probably be the beginning of a new era, in which its most important companies might be pushed to the sidelines. With such a meteoric rise, there are facts and data that show what makes the Tesla trajectory so extraordinary. So here we go. Five facts about Tesla. Number five, the first years were full of drama. Elon Musk has become the face of the company, but he wasn't there in the beginning. Tesla was founded in 2003 by engineers Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarpening. In 2004, the two partners were looking for investors when Musk appeared on the scene. This was after eBay bought PayPal, an operation that gave Musk $180 million 
according to reports. He then invested $6.4 million in Tesla, becoming chairman of the board. Eberhard was replaced as CEO and named president of technology in 2007. It didn't last long. He left in August of that same year. Eberhard publicly said that he was not happy with the situation. Musk blamed his inability to deliver the eagerly awaited first Tesla on schedule and on budget and said that sidelining the founder was a unanimous board decision. In 2009, Eberhard sued Tesla and Musk for libel and breach of contract. The lawsuit alleged that Musk sought to rewrite history by taking credit for the accomplishments, damaging Eberhard's reputation. But that wasn't all. The founder of Tesla also accused the company of not honoring its agreement after removing him from the CEO position, and that he did not receive his Tesla Roadster as promised. Instead, he received a damaged test car. Tesla at the time issued a statement claiming that the accusations were inaccurate and that Eberhard was fired because the Roadster model ended up costing more than double what he had estimated as CEO. Later that year, Eberhard dropped the lawsuit and there were reports of a settlement between both parties. The details of the settlement were not made public, but to this day, Musk is credited as co-founder on Tesla's website and corporate material. There are reports that Eberhard said he very much enjoys seeing Tesla's recent success, although he is not Musk's biggest fan. The feeling seems to be mutual. In 2019, Musk wrote on his Twitter account, Tesla is alive in spite of Eberhard, but he seeks credit constantly, and fools give it to him. The tweet was deleted later on the same day, proving that the drama from the beginning years still bubbles up. Number 4. Tesla sells much more than cars, even hot pants. The company is famous for its luxury electric cars, but sells much more than that. Among the items that it's possible to buy on its website, there are classical products like solar panels and car accessories, but also items such as toys and apparel. Let's look into the weirdest merchandising that people can buy on Tesla's website. One of the sold out products in the online shop is the women's shorts that cost $69.42. Launched in July 2020, the product was promoted on Elon Musk's Twitter upon its release, and there were reports claiming there was a hidden meaning behind it. Some say that the 42 cents was a jibe against short sellers, investors who bet against the company's stock, and anticipate a fall in price. $420 is the price at which Musk said he would take the company private in a previous tweet against the short sellers. That tweet prompted the Securities Exchange Commission to sue Musk for securities fraud after it sent Tesla's stock price soaring. Are the Tesla hot pants just a provocation? Number 3. Tesla Model S can be easily transformed into a James Bond car by pressing one button. Musk's obsession with the James Bond movies left the private sphere and entered the car's operating system. Model S owners can hold the T button on the center panel, which usually takes the user to a service screen, and see an image of the submersible Lotus Esprit S1, the car used in the James Bond The Spy Who Loved Me movie. What at first looks like just a gag is actually a very personal pun. Musk actually owns the original Lotus Esprit used in the 1977 movie. In 1989, a couple from Long Island paid roughly $100 for an unclaimed storage unit. It was a blind auction, and they had no idea what they had just actually purchased. Later, they realized they had bought the half-car, half-submarine from the James Bond movie. The couple restored the piece, displayed it in exhibits, and in 2013, put it up for auction at RM Sotheby's. The car was sold to a secret buyer for $997,000. Later that year, it was confirmed Musk was the secret buyer. In an interview, Musk mentioned his disappointment in knowing it was actually not a hybrid, but just worked underwater. And he said he would try to actually make the transformation from car to submarine a reality. According to Musk, the Lotus Esprit is not only a gag in the Model S operating system, but also influenced Tesla's Cybertruck design. Number 2. Tesla patents are accessible for anyone to use. In 2014, Musk posted a blog entry on Tesla's website titled, All Our Patents Belong to You, 
He wrote that patents enrich only those in the legal profession, had no actual benefit for investors, and therefore Tesla would share all its patents with any company that would like to invest in sustainable transportation. When he wrote the Tesla Post, the company was the assignee of over 350 utility and design patents in the United States. In his post, he asserted that the company would not initiate any patent lawsuit as long as the companies were acting in good faith. There was such speculation about what was behind the announcement. On the one side, people believed that it was a strategy to incentivize the market and expand Tesla's position. Musk's vision of the future includes electric automobiles and sophisticated energy storage systems. He is aware that Tesla alone will not be able to change the infrastructure around our current energy system, as it is needed to really unlock all the electric market's potential. Opening up the patents could instigate other companies to invest in the same direction as Tesla is doing, expanding the infrastructure and promoting changes that are so critical for Tesla's domination plan. But some also believe that the announcement was mainly a PR stunt. By adding good faith to the conditions, the use of technology by competitors is limited. According to reports, those using Tesla's patents in good faith would not be able to assert any patent or intellectual property right against Tesla, no matter what happens, giving Musk's company a free pass to use whatever technology it wants without the possibility of legal action. This could probably mean a level of exposure unwelcome in most of the corporations around the world. And that's not all. The companies using Tesla patents also need to be willing to agree not to assert its own patents against any company operating in the electric market anywhere in the world. Plus, they cannot produce a knockoff product. What a knockoff product would mean is up to Tesla and not explained in detail. With so many conditions, it's hard to believe that any company would take the risk of using Tesla's patents. But Musk has said in an interview that many companies are already using them. He did not release information on which companies or which patents. Number 1. Tesla is the first entirely foreign company allowed to operate on its own in China. In 2018, the Chinese government announced that it would change its policy for international investment in the field of electric cars. The shareholding limit, a tradition in all sectors, would be scrapped, and tariffs on imported cars would also be reduced. As a result of these changes, Tesla was the first Western company to be allowed to establish a Chinese subsidiary without having to partner with a local company. In 2019, the company opened its first factory in Shanghai. Tesla then had access to the biggest electric vehicle market in the world. In return, the company promised to open a research and development facility in the country and also to design specific cars for the local market. Let's look at the numbers of the Chinese market. According to the International Energy Agency, there were 7.2 million electric cars in the world in 2019. 47% of this total in China. In 2019 alone, 1.21 million electric autos were sold in the country. That represents 4.7% of the total. In 2018, e-cars were 4.5% of the Chinese market. All of this makes China the perfect place for Tesla to grow. And Musk seems to know that. China rocks, he said recently in a podcast interview. He praised Chinese workers as hardworking and said that he sees complacency and entitlement growing in the United States. But Tesla's exposure to China could also be a source of concern among investors. There are reports saying that some fear that maybe Tesla is exposing itself too much in a country which the U.S. government increasingly sees as an enemy. And now it's time to talk about Amazon. Let's take a look at how the government could possibly break the company up. Right now, Jeff Bezos is at the top of the world. He's the richest person on Earth. Amazon is valued at over $1 trillion, and every second, $11,000 worth of goods are sold on the platform he created. In 2019, the company delivered 3.5 billion packages, one for every two people on the planet. It seems like there is nothing that Bezos and his company can't do. Sales reached $280 billion in 2019. This amount is so huge 
that if it was a country, it would have a GDP bigger than Pakistan or Finland or Vietnam or Romania or, well, there are 166 countries in the world with a GDP smaller than $280 billion. But the continued astronomical growth and dominance of the marketplace has attracted unwanted scrutiny. Amazon has become too dominant. So much so that politicians, business owners, and former employees started to state publicly that the company shouldn't be allowed to exist in its current form. The firm is facing growing antitrust scrutiny and the idea that it should be broken up has moved from the fringes to an accepted mainstream talking point. But is it even possible? How would it work? Let's take a look. But to understand how a possible Amazon breakup would work, we first need to know how the company is set up. From the $280 billion in revenues in 2019, $141 billion came from online store sales. $53 billion is generated from third-party sellers on the Amazon platform. The Amazon Web Services generate $35 billion of total revenues. Subscription services like Audible, Amazon Prime Video, and Music account for $19 billion. And $17 billion come from sales in brick-and-mortar stores, with the Whole Foods chain in the United States making up for most of it. Other areas, like ad sales, for example, bring another $14 billion. Among analysts and industry experts, there are different ideas and solutions for a possible Amazon breakup. One of the most vocal supporters for reforming big tech is American Senator Elizabeth Warren, a former U.S. presidential candidate. She even announced a special plan to break up big tech companies during her campaign in 2019. According to her plan, two things need to be done. A. Amazon needs to stop selling its products on its platform. And B. It needs to give up some of its subsidiaries. Behind the calling for halting sales on its own platform is a series of accusations. Although officially against Amazon's policies, the Wall Street Journal has reported that the company's employees have used data from third-party sellers to pitch ideas for the private label business. The unfair scheme seems to work like this. An Amazon employee sees that a specific product is generating good sales and reviews. They would then inform the team on the Amazon Basics brand, which would develop a similar product. The new product would be placed ahead of the product on the Amazon website, most of the time with a killer discount with just enough differences to avoid copyright infringement. Due to Amazon's size, there's no problem offering huge discounts, making it pretty much impossible for small companies to compete against Amazon brand products. Warren's breakup plan would make the scheme impossible. Not only Amazon, but all companies with revenues of $25 billion or more that offer an online marketplace would not be able to sell their own brands on the platform. Plus, these companies would be prohibited from transferring third-party data or using it to their advantage. Another point of the breakup plan would be giving up companies. Warren's plan envisions Amazon selling Whole Foods, the supermarket chain bought in 2017 for $14 billion, and Zappos, an e-commerce rival that was bought in 2010 for $1 billion. The Amazon that would exist after those changes would lose most of its $17 billion in revenues from brick-and-mortar stores and would probably generate less from its Amazon Basic brand. But these actions would hardly represent any threats for its existence or capability to keep growing. The situation might be different if it affects the company's lucrative web service division. Tim Bray, a former Amazon Web Service Vice President, advocates that the company should be separated from its cloud business. He believes that the company should do that voluntarily before it is forced by antitrust authorities to change. After leaving the company in dispute, he posted a document online formulating a business case for breaking up the tech giant. He has also become one of Amazon's most critical voices. Bray writes in his text that spinning off the web service division could give the company an advantage as the connection with Amazon limits its growth. There are reports that companies like Walmart, for example, have told their tech suppliers to stay away from Amazon Web Services, afraid of giving away too much information to a direct competitor. The Web Services unit already provides storage, database, and other cloud services for companies like Netflix, Zoom, and government institutions like the CIA, and it has huge growth potential. Analysts predict that less than 10% of the estimated $4 trillion in annual global IT spending has migrated to the cloud. What would Amazon look like if it is forced to divest itself of its Web Service division? 
Let's take a look. Taking into consideration 2019 data, the sales would fall from $280 to $245.4 billion, and operating income would drop from $14.5 billion to $5.4 billion. Share value and market capitalization would also be affected, as this would mean the company loses its most profitable unit. Some analysts predict that the web services division could account for up to one-third of Amazon's market value. All that doesn't appear to be an advantage, right? So why would Amazon give up its most profitable unit voluntarily? Because it might not have another option. As Tim Bray pointed out, the beating of the antitrust drums is getting louder, and the company could end up in a better position if it decides to proactively spin off the web service, as opposed to under hostile pressure from Washington. This scenario allows them to retain control and, in a way, regulate themselves and minimize the risks. Another possible advantage of a breakup would be optimization. Some analysts believe that unproductive bureaucracy and politicizing are already a reality within the company, and that Amazon is much more worried about lobbying than actual innovation. As a result, a more streamlined, focused company would be more attractive to investors. But is there a realistic chance that antitrust authorities will force an Amazon breakup? Amazon's giant proportions will probably not be an issue. No company can be punished just because it's too big, but there are factors that could have consequences for the tech giant. Broadly defined, a monopoly is the capacity to control prices and exclude the competition. And some argue that Amazon, right now, would be able to do both in the United States. But a dominant position in the market is not illegal. It becomes illegal when it relies on what specialists call exclusionary conduct. That includes actions such as predatory pricing, exclusive agreements, refusing to deal with a specific company, designing products or providing services in a way that excludes competition. Has Amazon done that? According to some publications, the Federal Trade Commission investigators have been speaking with Amazon suppliers and found indications that Amazon abused its power over them. But this still needs to be proved. It's hard to predict what the results of the investigation will mean to the future of Amazon, but the company seems to be aware of the fact that tough times may lie ahead. The giant tech dedicated 10 pages to its 2019 financial report to explain the risk factors that the company is facing, pointing to government investigations as one of them. The outcome of these matters is inherently unpredictable and subject to significant uncertainties, the report stated. It is also important to note that not only the United States has focused on Amazon's practices, the European Commission is also investigating whether Amazon has used data from retailers to its advantage, thereby breaking EU laws. The truth is that many questions still lie ahead. Depending on the results of all investigations, Amazon as we know it today might soon be something of the past. Until then, Bezos continues to sit at the top. Time will tell for how much longer. And now let's take a look at the secrets of old Japanese companies. In a world where the average lifespan of a company is less than 20 years, there is a country that defies the statistics. Japan is home to most of the old companies in the world. The Shine Eyes, as these ancient businesses are known, are considered national treasures and some of them have operated for more than a thousand years. But what makes the country such an old business superpower? Let's take a look. Japan has more than 33,000 companies that are more than 100 years old, over 40% of the world's total. Around 140 have existed for more than 500 years, and at least 19 say they have operated for more than a thousand years. Behind all these numbers are companies that have endured a lot of difficulties throughout the time period, but they all managed to survive. How was this possible? There are some secrets behind this. One of the main reasons why there are so many old Japanese companies is the kind of business they are in. Usually, they are in areas of the economy that are connected to the lives of the communities they are based in. Many of them produce products that have cultural importance like taiko drums, paper lanterns, dolls, brushes. Having this cultural attachment with the community gives them a continuous endorsement of tradition and endless consumers, making it harder for them to fail. Let's look into some examples. A company called Ichiwa, for example, sells toasted machi in Kyoto. The business started selling refreshments for travelers a thousand years ago, and it has morphed into what it is today. The company is connected with something very important, religion. It serves mainly the next-door shrine's pilgrims. 
So, as long as pilgrims continue to go to the shrine, Ichiwa will still have clients. Another example is Tsuan Tea Kyoto. Tea is a very important part of Japanese culture and has a special meaning in pretty much every household. Or the construction company Kongo Gumi, which builds temples and shrines, and it's believed to be founded in the year 578. All these companies profit from cultural traditions, activities that do not depend solely on how well the economy goes. This characteristic gives them a higher chance of longevity. Another common feature of these companies is that they are mainly family-owned businesses. And that means they share some other common characteristics. Most of them operate according to what Japanese people call kaken, which means family precepts. Different from a normal company, which is supposed to maximize profit, scale up the size, market share and growth, these businesses operate on different priorities. They don't aim to just make a profit, but also to care for their community and, most importantly, carry on existing. Each generation has the responsibility to pass the business to the next. And giving up is not an option. Continuing the family business is a matter of pride and must be done no matter what. So much so that these companies have a very high aversion to risks. And that's due not only to fear of losing control of the business, but also due to the many past crises that Japan has endured. That's why they often have very large cash reserves, bulletproofing them against unexpected crises and avoiding risks of bankruptcy. Among Japan's oldest companies, even when they make profits, they do not increase their capital expenditure. Most keep business as usual, saving the extra profit for harder times. On top of that, nowadays, if they need extra money, it's fairly easy and cheap to get financing. Interest rates in Japan have been low for decades. But this is a more recent phenomenon. Historically, family ties played a much more important role in keeping this business flow. In most cases, the company is inherited by the eldest son of the family. In any other country, this is far from a guarantee of success. But in Japan, there is a big twist that makes family continuity a big advantage. Let's look into what the secret is. Passing a company to the eldest son can be a bit like Russian roulette. Luckily, it won't be fatal. But there is no guarantee that there is not a bullet on the other side. To avoid companies being inherited by less talented offspring, Japan has solved the situation with a very peculiar law. If a business owner did not trust his firstborn son to take the helm, he can adopt a son and run the business. Japan is famous for having a very low birth rate. One-child families are very common. And although daughters are allowed to inherit the business and there are successful Japanese businesswomen, the country still has a mostly male-centered culture. But this is not a problem for families with only daughters when it comes to passing the family companies on. Thanks to the adoption law, owners without a son planning their retirement can also look to their daughter's potential husbands to take the company's helm. If the daughter's boyfriend is possibly a good businessman, he can be adopted as a son by the family. This way, the company will stay in the family's control. This kind of adoption is known in Japan as Mukoyoshi, and some estimate that they represent more than 90% of the around 80,000 adoptions per year in the country. A study has shown that businesses run by adopted heirs consistently outperformed those run by blood heirs. The practice is widespread, not only in big companies, but also in small and medium-sized businesses as well. Sometimes even families with biological sons will opt for the practice if they believe that nature has not been so good to their heir. This practice gives Japanese family businesses a talent pool as a professionally managed firm would have. And that's a big advantage. Suzuki Motors, the famous car maker, is one of the family businesses that took advantage of the practice. Osamu Suzuki, the long-term company's president who retired in February 2021, was a Mukoyoshi. He was the fourth adopted son in a run to lead the company. Under his tenure, Suzuki became a powerhouse and enjoyed decades of growth and success. As this example shows, choosing a son for his ability to run the family business can be a successful strategy. Japan is an island. This geographical characteristic meant for a long time that the country was isolated from neighbors and therefore needed to be self-sustainable. This created a very fertile case for companies to develop and prosper among its very long history. This became especially true from the beginning of the 17th century, 
when Japan largely sealed itself off from the outside world in an isolationist foreign policy that lasted centuries and was known as Sokoku. During this time, foreigners weren't allowed in and Japanese people were not allowed out. These policies provided a stable business environment, although one can argue they are also bad in many ways. And by 1870, Japan became the first non-Western, no-Christian country to industrialize. During this period, Japan already had well-developed agriculture and urban populations that were considered sophisticated for the time. This old and strong economy was a fertile scenario for businesses. Many of these ancient companies were created along the route between Tokyo and Kyoto, which was very busy and full of opportunities. With a strong internal market and inside movement of people, companies were able to establish themselves early on. Besides all these points, we need to mention that a company surviving through millennials has probably more to do with circumstances than any specific ideas or measures. But the fact that a lot of them are concentrated in Japan proves that somehow cultural, economic and geographical characteristics have played a role in business longevity. And before we end the video, it's also important to point out that not all the thousand-year-old Japanese companies can trace their origins back to their founding. For many, there is no real proof of their history and one cannot confirm with facts what happened in all this time. But their timelines are generally accepted by the government, historians and scholars. And as we showed, they all have many things in common. And now, let's look into how companies are trying to make profit from space business. Exploring space has always been a nationally funded endeavor. Until now. Suddenly, it's private companies at the forefront to conquer the universe. They are popping up all over the world. Are we about to witness a new era of space exploration? Let's look into what is changing and how the space business is working with private money. On May 30th, 2020, the Falcon 9 rocket launched the space capsule Crew Dragon with two astronauts on board. One day later, the two men safely docked onto the International Space Station, where they stayed until August 1st, and then safely returned to Earth. Though flying to the ISS and returning has become routine in recent years, this was no ordinary feat. Actually, this flight was groundbreaking, for two reasons. First, it gave back to the United States the capability to send people to space on their own. Since 2011, when the shuttle program was axed, American astronauts have been relying on none other than Russia to get to the ISS. Secondly, this flight was an economic revolution. For the first time in history, a private company was taking astronauts to the ISS and safely returning them to Earth. The company? SpaceX. And the revolutionary behind it was serial entrepreneur and billionaire Elon Musk. But how did this actually happen? SpaceX is part of NASA's commercial crew program, the latest push from the space agency to engage private companies and create a market that is not totally dependent on federal investment. Owning the rocket and the capsule, SpaceX can, in theory, fly whoever is interested and can afford it. The ultimate goal is to transform NASA from a provider into a normal client who pays for the seats on space flights like everybody else. In an analogy to the airline market, NASA would buy a ticket without owning the planes anymore. With several companies competing against each other, the space agency would be able to purchase seats for a cheaper price than if it had to invest in development of spacecrafts and be responsible for the whole process. The cost reduction was already obvious on this premier private mission. The estimated price tag for a seat on the Crew Dragon, $55 million, compared to previous space adventure costs, we're talking cheap. One could say, revolutionary. To understand how we got to this historic moment, we need to look back into the past. More precisely, to 1982, when the first successful launch of a commercial rocket in the United States took place. The Conestoga rocket was developed by a Texan company named Space Services, but the authorization procedure back then was so bureaucratic, therefore way too time-consuming. Legislation had to be changed. That same year, then-US President Ronald Reagan made it clear that private sector involvement in civil space activities should be a national goal. 
U.S. Congress would uphold this ambition in October 1984, when the Commercial Space Launch Act confirmed and expanded the government's intention of allowing private companies into the space industry game. Unfortunately, U.S. firms remained largely uninterested in offering commercial launch services. At that time, it was impossible to compete with NASA's own shuttle program, which provided the same services. As a result, the U.S. government limited NASA's role providing commercial launches that required the shuttle's unique capabilities. Still, the private sector's ambition to put efforts in the business didn't pick up and was close to non-existent. A new government policy in 1988 permanently changed the playing field. It forced U.S. government agencies to purchase launch services from commercial companies. Et voila! In March 1989, Space Service Inc. sent the first scientific payload on a suborbital trip, and the nucleus of an idea formed for a commercial launch services industry. In the following years, the market developed further, thanks mainly to the satellite industry and public investment. Between 2006 and 2013, NASA rewarded three companies with contracts to develop commercial vehicles to ferry cargo to and from low-orbit Earth, freeing up NASA resources to develop the next-generation spacecraft for this purpose. The result was in fact a new space race, but this time among companies in the private sector. Elon Musk's SpaceX was the first company to get one of the contracts. On May 5, 2012, SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket delivered payload to the ISS and returned to Earth for the first time. To make the mission happen, NASA's contract gave SpaceX $396 million, and the company also raised $450 million from different investors. The second company awarded with a similar contract was rocket plane Kistler. But unlike SpaceX, it was unable to raise additional funds to finish the project, so NASA canceled the contract in October 2007. Three years later, the company filed for bankruptcy. A company called Orbital Sciences Corp. replaced rocket plane Kistler, which in 2013 became the second company to deliver payload to the ISS. In 2014, the Orbital merged with Alliant Tech Systems, and in 2018 was bought by Northrop Grumman, which to this day still delivers payload for NASA. Following the competition to deliver the first payload to and from the ISS, the most pressing question was, who will actually succeed first in sending astronauts to the space station? For this mission, NASA awarded contracts to SpaceX and Boeing. Through NASA's commercial crew program, the company founded by Elon Musk received $2.5 billion, while Boeing, a traditional NASA partner, got $4.5 billion. Yep, for the same mission. The discrepancy of values was so big that Musk, like always, even protested on Twitter when the amounts were made public. This doesn't seem right, he wrote on his page. Despite the difference in the contract, the SpaceX once again won the race, and after successfully concluding the last test flight in May 2020, was certified for operational missions to the space station. And the next race is on. NASA is using the same kind of partnership to develop its human landing systems. As part of the Artemis program, with plans to bring astronauts to the moon by 2024, the agency awarded contracts to SpaceX, Dynetics, and Blue Origin to develop the next moon lander. Blue Origin is the company created by Jeff Bezos, Amazon's founder, and is becoming a bigger player in this market not only thanks to NASA's contract, but also due to Bezos' private fortune. The billionaire sells the equivalent of $1 billion on Amazon stock every year to invest in the company. But the success of companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin and its founders are the most noted accomplishments within the market of space companies that have seen growing investments in the last years. In 2019, investment in startup space ventures totaled $5.7 billion, about $2.2 billion more than the year before. As expected, most of this went to SpaceX and Blue Origin. In total, there were 135 startup space ventures that received investments in 2019, an increase of 34% from the year before. Okay, so it looks like investors think they can join the bandwagon of big bucks up for grabs in companies dedicated to space exploration. But how much is this market actually worth? 
In 2019, the global space economy reached an estimated $366 billion. The majority of this includes the satellite industry, responsible for $253.3 billion of the pie. That comprises television services, navigation devices, satellite manufacturing, satellite launches, among other services. The remaining $95 billion represents the non-satellite industry, most of it still coming from government budgets, more than half of that amount from the United States. In 2019, there were 102 orbital launches in the world, with only 16 of those launches from private companies. But the SpaceX feat can pave the way for more companies to do the same, and the prospects are looking pretty good. According to estimates made by investment bank UBS, the space market has potential to grow almost threefold by 2040, reaching $926 billion. Ground equipment could be responsible for 331 of this total, satellite internet for 300 billion, consumer TV for 98 billion, government contracts for 68 billion, and a remaining 130 billion for various other projects. What other activities can we expect? One of the most anticipated is space tourism. Dennis Tito, the first space tourist able to fund his own trip, paid $20 million to fly to the ISS in 2001. The race now is to see which company will be able to offer safe and affordable prices. But the truth is, it's not looking good for the average earner in the near future. Virgin Galactic, for example, is already accepting reservations for its low orbital flight. Those able to pay $250,000 up front can secure their spot. The company has already successfully completed two test flights and there is one expected in October 2020. If the next two test flights succeed, Virgin announced that the founder, Richard Branson, will be next on board sometime in the first quarter of 2021. Although Branson's company recently received large investments, it lost $60 million in the first quarter of 2020, down from the $73 million net loss it suffered in 2019. The plans for space tourism are not only part of Virgin's strategy. SpaceX, for example, already announced a deal with Virginia-based company Space Adventures to fly four space tourists on the Crew Dragon. The flight is expected to take off sometime in late 2021. Blue Origin also has the same ambitions and plans to start putting tourists in orbit in the next years. Because it will probably take some time for these companies to get any returns on their investments, tickets will most likely be very expensive, at least initially. So just like in the beginnings of commercial airline flights, space travel will be reserved for the wealthiest among us. And here we are, another space race, this time to see which company will be able to offer the safest, most affordable tickets to space tourists. But that's not the only ongoing race. Some companies are also targeting the resources from out of Earth. According to a Goldman Sachs report, one asteroid the size of a football field could be a source of $25 to $50 billion worth of platinum, for example. Interesting to note, this amount of platinum would actually crash the market for the mineral on Earth. But exploring resources from outer space is not science fiction anymore. The main objective of NASA's Artemis project is to create a base on the moon where people would be able to learn how to live in space, training for the next big goal, landing on Mars. For that, astronauts must learn how to identify and explore the resources available on the moon. The Japanese startup iSpace is also looking into this possibility. The company, which raised $28 million in Series B funding in August 2020, plans to use rovers to map and identify water and other natural resources on the moon. The first iSpace mission is planned for 2022 and the second for 2023. And besides looking for resources on the moon, the company also plans to profit from ad space, offering companies to put their logos on its spacecraft and rovers. With so much money in the game, it's natural that investors are channeling financial resources into the sector. But are we really about to see a new era of space exploration? After years of low-orbit flights and missions to the ISS financed by state agencies, the signs of change are visible. Although a lot still needs to happen, one thing is certain. The protagonism of government space agencies seem to be shifting. The venture capital and billionaires are stepping in, and a new era is likely shaping up 
before our eyes. That's it for this video. Since you made it to the end, stick around. Click into our other videos and keep watching.